Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Welcome to Westside. My name is Evan. I'm the Creative Arts Pastor here, and it's uh, just a great day to be together. I know, I think Friday, was it, where the sun was out and it was warm and it felt like spring? We went down to the park, my wife and I, with our our two-year-old son, and we were playing on the playground, and this young lady was there with a little girl that she is a nanny for, and she shared with us that she had just moved here from Arizona, and then she said this, she said, but you know what, this winter wasn't that bad, and she used the past tense, wasn't that bad. I didn't have the heart to tell her, oh, we're just getting started around here. (laughs) She just... Any, any Arizona transplants in the crowd today? Anybody? Any, all right. Well, welcome to Bend. How long have you been here? Uh, about 10 years. 10 years. Okay. So it, you made it. <laughs> and it's still tough. You still got to buckle up for the winters. But anyway, so the next 20 weeks as we head out of the winter uh, will be great. And no, hopefully it won't take that long. But well, we're going to start a series today out of the book of Luke. I'm really excited about this. We're going to spend 10 weeks uh, walking through Luke's gospel as we head towards Easter, which is just 10 weeks away, and couldn't be more um, interested in what God will do through our church and in our church as we open up uh, the gospel of Luke and look at the life of Jesus. And so we're going to be in Luke chapter 1 today, if you brought a Bible. If not, that's okay, too. It'll be up on the screen. But, you know, I was, I was thinking back, and one of the fastest-selling biographies of the last 20 years, you might be able to guess it, was by the founder of a little company called Apple. So this man, Steve Jobs, after his death in 2011, uh, his biography became an international bestseller. And uh, it's, a, it's a thick book, really walks through all the nuances of what made Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs. Uh, Walter Isaacson was, is a famous biographer. And Steve had talked to him and and said very specifically he didn't want it to come off like propaganda, that he wanted an honest look, uh, rough edges included, about what made Steve Jobs Steve Jobs. And I want to pose a hypothetical situation that would never happen, but let's pretend for the sake of of today's lesson that that it would. Let's say that tomorrow uh, Steve, not Steve Jobs, but Tim Cook, the current CEO of Apple, steps down, no longer the CEO. And the board of directors, out of nowhere, gets a hold of you. They call you up on the phone, and they say, this is crazy. You're never going to believe it. But we found a line in Steve Jobs' will that says, if it doesn't work out with Tim Cook, we want you to be the next CEO of Apple. We want you to carry on the legacy that Steve Jobs started when he founded this company. To which, what would you do? Let's say, for for the sake of this argument, that you accept it, and immediately you think, oh, man, I'm still using a Windows desktop at my house, (laughs) and it was good they called me on my landline, because that's all I got. I don't even have a cell phone. I've got some work to do, right? So you immediately drive down to the Apple store. Uh, You wait in line. You you say, hey, I'm I'm the new CEO. Nice to meet you. (laughs) How does this thing work? And you buy a computer. And you're like, you know, and I want to be a company man or a company woman, so give me a phone too. So you get an iPhone. Then you go back home and you live your normal life, work your normal job, watch Netflix in the evenings. And a couple weeks go by and you realize, you know what, they want me to start on March 1st. I probably got to do some work here. And so you go back to the Apple store, shake some hands, meet some people. You ask them if they can help you unlock your phone. You still haven't been able to get into it. (laughs) And you realize, man, I've got a week to fulfill the legacy and be the successor to the founder of this company, Steve Jobs. It wouldn't be enough, would it? It wouldn't be enough to hang out in the store a few times. It wouldn't be enough to be a consumer of the product, which is a good start, though. It would take more. And I think you see where I'm going with this, that if we are followers of Jesus, and I I hope you are, I hope you hear that call from God, that we are to be Christians, right? This idea that we're little Christ. We are the followers, the apprentices, the successors to Jesus and his mission in the world. And if that's the case, a good place to start, if we want to fulfill what Paul called us to in Philippians chapter 2, where he said, let your mindset be the same as that of Christ Jesus. It's not enough to just be consumers of the gospel. It's not enough just to hang out in church and be loyal customers, which is great. We've got to go a step further. And if you want to get into the head of Steve Jobs, 
He's no longer with us, so what would you do? You would look at the biography. You would read it page after page, and you wouldn't read it passively. You would read it with great interest. Why? Because it's your job next. It's your job next. And so here we are, and as, as people who follow after Jesus, it's our job next. That, that Christ's mission, his calling, his purpose, is now our purpose, our calling, and our job. It's what we're here to do. And so we would do well to read the biography. And so we're going to walk through this, this book, and it's, it's beautiful. It's well-written. Now, Luke was most likely um, non-Jewish. He was most likely a Gentile. We know this because we can tell, scholars can tell by the way that he wrote Luke, that Greek, Koine Greek, which was the language that all the Gospels were written in, was definitely his first language. Uh, he writes very well, eloquently. Um, Matthew and Mark were written before the, the Gospel of Luke, and their Greek was just no good, actually. <laughs> They were Aramaic speakers as Jews, and so they did their best. But I get the sense from reading scholars that Luke read their Gospels and was like, boys, let me show you how it's done. And so in eloquent, eloquent uh, it's a shame when you mess up the word eloquent when you're trying to speak. Elo eloquent Greek, in really good Greek, Luke writes his Gospel. And uh, he does this as a, a series. There's two volumes in his work, both Luke and the book of Acts are written together. I know they're divided by the book of John in your Bible, but originally he wrote these together. And he wasn't a contemporary of Jesus. He was too young. And so uh, as we get into the second half of the first century, many of the disciples and the apostles that were with Jesus are starting to die off, and they're being killed. And in AD 65, AD 65 uh, both Peter and Paul are killed. And so this throws into high gear the idea that it is of vital importance to the future of the church, uh, that the eyewitness accounts of what happened that changed so much for them in Galilee in the first century, so much of that be written down. And so Luke is a doctor. Uh, he's well-spoken. Uh, he writes well. And so he sets down uh, the task of chronicling both the life of Jesus and then the life of the early church in the book of Acts. Um, and really what, what we are presented with as we launch into this book and into the gospel of Jesus, and this is true whenever we, we speak of who Jesus is and, and what he taught and how he lived, the question is, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to be the successor of Jesus? What does it mean to follow in his footsteps? If we're not asking that question, we should be. Uh, if we wear the name Christian, if we wear the name little Christ, if we, if we say we follow him, we should be asking the question, what does it mean? to follow him. I like this quote by a pastor in Portland, John Mark Comer. He says, remember the question we should be constantly asking as followers of Jesus isn't actually what would Jesus do? A more helpful question is what would Jesus do if he were me? If he had my gender, my career, my income, my relationship status, if he was born in the same year as me, lived in the same city as me, what would that look like? To follow Jesus is to ask that question until our last breath. You see, we have this task not to ask what Jesus would do if we just got a time machine and transplanted Jesus from the first century into the 21st century. Uh, because unless you are a woodworking ancient rabbi, and I don't see any in the crowd today, we're going to have to interpret his life and his ways and say, how does that apply to our lives here in the 21st century in a culture that is vastly different. And culture is a funny thing. It's so much more than just our customs of what we eat and how we speak and, and, and what kind of architecture is in our cities. It's, it's so much more. It's a, at the physiological level, culture is built into us. And I know this, uh, and here's an example. How many of you are huggers in the, in the room today? You're huggers. All right, all right. See, first service, I asked how many are not huggers? No hands went up because... People who are not huggers are also not hand raisers. It's the same exact group. <laughs> They're one and the same. I realized I asked the wrong question. So this has been working out good. How many are huggers? All the hands go up. Okay, we got it. Now, I would not, I would not put myself in the category of hugger. I'm just going to be honest. That I will give you a hug if it's absolutely necessary. For instance, if you're one of my children. <laughs> Other than that... It maybe it's not that bad, but I know, I know some of you, I know some of you are, are very much huggers. In fact, we have one of our worship leaders here, uh, Max Clark. I don't know if you know Max. 
uh, he leads worship from time to time for us here, and um, he's definitely in the camp of hugger. Now, an appropriate length of hug for me is right around the one to one and a half second mark, and it's usually on the side. You come around from the side, firm squeeze, and you're done. Max's idea of an appropriate hug, and maybe he's here, and hi, Max, if you are. You're probably hugging someone in the lobby, but his idea of an appropriate length of hug is somewhere in the 15 to 150 second hug, that's, or at least that's what it feels like. And so I'll see him in the hallways, and I love Max. I mean, I, I love him, and he's wonderful, and nothing about him repulses or repels me. I'm just going to say that right now. But I know when he's coming around the corner, there's a hug in my future. <laughs> it's coming. And here's why it gets physiological, is you can tell if you're not a hugger and someone is hugging you, your body responds separate of what you're consciously thinking. All of a sudden, you're like, man... Have I been sweating this much already? Like, is this a... And you feel it. And this is the, the, the nature of... That's just one example. But when culture is different than yours, is more than just how do we think or how do we act or what kind of foods do we eat. It's something that is altogether foreign to us. And I love this quote. L.P. Hartley said, The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. So when we look back and we, we take, you know, these Gospels that were written thousands of years ago... We have to apply them to our lives, and, and we've been applying them to our lives as church for thousands of years. We're still here, but we have to do it with interpretation. We have to not just say, what would Jesus do, but what would Jesus do here now in this city, in my city, in my life? And we apply that to our lives. And the question that we ask then, or what we are looking for as we dive into the story of Jesus is two things, and you can write this down. We're looking for both the truth of Jesus and we're looking for the way of Jesus. If you take any one of those two on their own and independently go after, let's say, the way of Jesus, for instance, and we love the way that Jesus um, walked and talked and, and how he worked with people and how he loved and showed compassion for those who uh, traditionally were, were marginalized and outcasts and and that's really compelling. I, I've talked to a lot of people, especially millennials, younger people, that, that love the way of Jesus. But man, the truth of Jesus is a little bit harder to take. Don't, you know, let me, let me act in the same ways that Jesus acted. But to believe the things that Jesus said, that's, that's tough. Um, he said some things that, that take a lot of faith. He said some things that take belief in, in the supernatural and, and in God. And man, that's tough for a lot of people. And on the other side, you have people, maybe especially people that have, have, have been inside the church for a long, long time, where the truth of Jesus, we've got that down, man. Like, we, we believe what we believe, and we, we hold up our Bibles, and, and we believe the truth of what Jesus said, and the doctrine, and our theology, and it's all in line with what Jesus taught. But the way of Jesus, now that's the tough part, to actually live among the lowest of society, to live among the least of these, to love people like Jesus did. And, and the example I, I think of is, is if, if you wanted to, you know, just have an experience with Jesus on the truth level, and you just wanted this one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus where it's just you and Jesus talking about who God is, and, and I was thinking, it's almost like you get in a car and you're hoping you're going to have this wonderful talk just with you and Jesus, and then you look in the back and you realize the whole back seat is filled with people. And he's always bringing people along. It's like those clown cars where the people just keep coming out of the car. And it's like wherever Jesus goes, he's going to bring people along with him. And they're going to need love and they're going to need compassion. And they're going to be brokenness there that, that needs a touch from him and from you. And, and so it's hard to embrace both. And what Jesus is going to consistently and, and frequently do as we look through the story of his life is he's going to ask us to embrace both. To embrace both the truth of his message and the way that he lived. Can't do one or the other. And as we get into this, uh, I want to go now to uh, Luke chapter 1. So if you have a Bible or you want to look at it on the screen, Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They use the eyewitness reports circulating uh, among us from early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. We don't know exactly who Theophilus was by the way he addresses him. 
in this book and in the book of Acts, uh, we can assume that, that he was probably uh, a wealthy follower uh, of, of Christ who was supportive of this ministry, supportive of Luke. And so Luke addresses this gospel to him, but it is for all of us for all time. And so what Luke is going to do throughout his book and, and throughout the book of Acts as well is he's going to draw a line from Jesus as the one that the Old Testament promised would come all the way to that moment when the gospel reaches Rome, representing the moment when the way of Jesus and the kingdom of God is now opened up, not just to Jews, but to Gentiles alike. And I'm glad for that. So check out this video. It gives us a little bit more context of the book of Luke. The gospel according to Luke it's one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life, and it's actually part one of a unified two-volume work, Luke Acts. If you compare the opening lines of both of these books, it's clear that they come from the same author. And there are internal clues in the book of Acts, as well as an early tradition that identifies the author as Luke, the traveling companion and co-worker of Paul the Apostle, who we know was also a doctor. Luke opens his work with a preface telling us how and why he wrote this book. He acknowledges that there's many other fine accounts of Jesus' life out there, but he wanted to go back to the eyewitness traditions of as many early disciples as he could in order to produce what he calls an orderly account about the things that have been fulfilled among us. Now that word fulfilled shows us why Luke wrote this account. For him, the story of Jesus isn't just ancient history. He wants to show how it's the fulfillment of the long covenant story of God and Israel, and bigger than that, of the story of God and the whole world. The story of God and the whole world. Um, last week, Steve talked about his career as a uh, professional college athlete in the Christian college circuit, which is pretty impressive, I would say. Um, and it made me think that many of you probably don't naturally assume that I was an athlete in school, but it's true I was in elementary school in the Parks and Rec Division in third grade. And so I want to share a story about this because I was something else on the field. I played baseball, and I remember showing up, and it was the first day, and our, our team of, I think, second and third graders were all there and, and were showing the coach what we could do. And I remember <laughs> being so judgmental about these other little second and third graders and their skills. And I remember vividly the coach taking uh, a ball and, and very slowly rolling it on the ground. And this little second grade girl had her mitt. She could barely hold the mitt. And it was like a slow motion version of whack-a-mole where she was trying to put the mitt on the ball and couldn't do it. And I thought, this is what we got to work with as a team? This is it? Come on, bend. And so um, very judgmental. And then we got assigned our different positions to play in our first game. And I didn't think about it at the time, but reflecting back on it, um, I was assigned to the outfield. Now, if you know anything about second grade baseball, Parks and Rec, you know that the ball never, ever, ever makes it to the outfield. <laughs> Not a single time. I mean, it is, a, it is almost supernatural if the, if the ball ever makes it to the outfield in second grade. And so it was the equivalent, basically, of the coach saying, okay, we got our other position. Oh, and Evan, you go stand in the corner. That's where we need you the most, buddy. And so I spent uh, most of that season in the outfield. You see, I had this idea that, that I was superior. I was better. I knew how it should be. But when it came down to my ability, I was very lacking. And so this is what I want us to do as we dive into Luke. Forget everything you think you know about the gospel. Forget everything you think you know about Jesus. Can we open this book up with fresh eyes and say, Jesus, if I was looking at your life and your biography, knowing nothing about you, how would this strike me? What would I gain from this? Because we can get in, in the way of our own progress and growth in Christ by thinking we know too much, by thinking we are the experts when God says, I would, I would love to develop you into my apprentice, into someone that could follow after me, but we have to get over what we think we already know as we embrace this idea of his truth and his way, because the truth is that he's going to bring values to us that even as, as, as a community of faith still are foreign to us. Um, for instance, it's, it's one thing to say, um, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said that, beautiful. He also said that we're to love our enemies. Well, that's difficult, but we can get behind that in theory, in theory. 
And then you actually have an enemy. And you realize that the Jesus of the Gospels would ask you to love that enemy in the same way that you love your kids? Well, that's tough. And so it's this, this alien value system that comes in, much as it did in the first century to those that Jesus was around. It's altogether outside of who we naturally are, the way that Jesus and his values come into our lives. Can I have that um, prop? A couple weeks ago, Pastor Bo was speaking, and she brought a prop And she mentioned that I had given her a hard time for using a prop. And so I want to set the record straight that I'm also a big fan of props. And so I spent all morning going through my children's toys to build a prop for you today. Is that that cool? I hope Bo is watching and realizes my deep love for props is shared with her. So. So Jesus comes into his context, into the world of the Roman Empire. And in that world, there was a very set order of things. There was a very set order of social status, and where you stood in that society was set for life. You didn't rise up and fight that. You didn't, you didn't protest that. If you did, you were very quickly put out and killed by the Roman Empire. Why? Because they had a way of doing things. You don't mess with it. And so what that system looked like was on the bottom of society, uh, you have the slaves. These are little characters, by the way. Uh, You have slaves, you have um, the poor, you have those with no pedigree, you have um, people that that have no influence and can't speak into society, you have women, you have all these categories of people that are disposable, useful, but disposable to the empire. And it's on their backs that then all of the empire is built. And so uh, the sense of, of the crushing power of what they are building is on the backs of the least of those in society. And then at the top, of course, uh, you have people who have the pedigree. They were born into the right situation. They have wealth. They have power. They have honor. They are conquerors. They have glory. They have military might in Rome. They have religious power in the Jewish system. And they are sitting on the top. And there's the money. And there's the power. And that's how things are. And they don't change for hundreds of years in the empire. And so it's settled. That's just how it's going to work. And if you were born at the lowest rungs of society, you had no hope of ever being anywhere but the bottom. And then Jesus shows up. And he doesn't just shake things up. He turns it upside down. And this is where the illustration really shines, I think. (laughs) Thank you. He turns not just the order of things upside down, but he turns the values of society upside down and he makes them official for all time through something called the church. And what he starts with his, even the the announcement of his birth starts this, where those who are traditionally on the bottom of society become the heroes of his story. And we're going to see this in Luke. The heroes of the gospel of Luke are not the powerful and the mighty and those with the right pedigree. They are the weak and the powerless and the blind and the lame. They are the the dozens of of women who had no place in that society that are mentioned more than any other gospel. In the gospel of Luke, Luke takes notice of those that got Jesus' attention, and they are the ones that are traditionally at the bottom of the heap of Roman society. Jesus turns it all on its head. And we see this in in one example in, in Luke chapter 1 that I want to focus on in just just the next couple minutes here is when the angel comes to Mary, right? The angel comes to Mary and says, highly favored one, you're you're going to conceive by the Holy Spirit and you're going to give birth to a child and he's going to save his people from their sins. His name will be Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, The angel promises the coming of a son through the Holy Spirit to Mary. Wow, that's amazing. That's a miracle. And the the object of that miracle is what? The baby that's going to come from her. What a miracle. And so if, if I'm writing the response, if that angel came to me and said something of that magnitude, I would think my response would have a lot to do with the child. But check out Mary's response, her famous response in Luke chapter 1, verse 46. This is right after the angel tells her what's about to happen with the coming of Jesus. And she says, oh, how my soul praises the Lord. 
How my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. Okay, she hasn't mentioned baby Jesus yet, but I think she'll get there. Let's find out. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. Okay, still about her, not about Jesus. We'll get there. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. Okay, well, now she's talking about the high people in society, and that's still not about Jesus. Okay, she'll get to it. He has brought down the princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. Okay, Jesus, not, not in there yet. She'll get there. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. She never mentions the baby. See, if, if an angel comes to us today and talks about a baby being born, our focus is going to be on the gift of the child. This tells us just how impossible it was that someone would notice her. That after the angel leaves, I, I assume she's impressed by the fact that there's a baby that's going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit. What she's more impressed with is the fact that God's turning it upside down. And it's someone who has no right to get any attention from anyone of any consequence much less Almighty God would take notice of her. And so her whole, her whole song of praise, I can't believe God would take notice of me. I can't believe he would take the lowly and raise them up. I can't believe he would flip this thing on its head. And we see this, and we're going to watch this through the gospel as Jesus goes out and he heals and he performs miracles and he feeds 5,000 people with a single meal and, and he's going to do all these miracles and the miracles are going to draw people towards him and, and multitudes are going to follow him because of his miracles. But do you know what I believe? Is that what actually turned the world on its head, what actually made it so that 2,000 years later we are gathering in a room to talk about him is not the miracles he performed, but it's the values that he shook at their very core. It's what he turned upside down. It's called the kingdom of God, and it's upside down. And this idea is, is, is going to come up again and again. And so this is the truth. If, if you are uncomfortable around people who have problems, if you don't like being around brokenness, if, if, if you don't like being around the sick and the needy and those that, that are poor, and then you're probably not going to like Jesus because his clown car is filled with them. And everywhere he goes, he's going to heal the broken. And he's going to tell the poor that they have a place in the kingdom of God. And he's going to take notice of people that have never been noticed. Um, this morning I was reading a blog post that my, my brother Brent wrote about several, several years ago when here at Westside we had a ministry called Adopt-A-Block and we would go into neighborhoods, low-income neighborhoods and high-crime neighborhoods here in, in Bend and would minister and just go door-to-door -to -door and try to meet needs where we could. And, and he had encountered this, this family that had been in and out of homelessness. And so over a course of months, he, he would go back and he would meet them and they would talk on the phone and and then one day, uh, the, the dad of this family calls my brother Brent, and he says, hey, Brent, we've been homeless, but we found a place to live. It's out of town. And so if you can, would you meet me at my, um, my storage unit and l help us load our, our belongings and our furniture into a U-Haul so we can move to where we, we found a place to stay? And Brent's like, oh, this is great. I've been praying for them and, and working with them. And, and so he goes to this storage unit with them, and, and they have the U-Haul, and and so all day long, they, they spend loading up this U-Haul and getting all their stuff. And, and finally, they're all loaded up, and Brent prays for them and gives them a hug. And he's like a middle-of-the-road hugger. Like, he doesn't hate it, but he doesn't love it. So he's right in the middle. So it's gives him a hug and, and sends them off on their way. And, and there's just this sense of, like, oh, this is so great that I was able to help them. The next day, Brent gets a call. And he answers the phone, and the guy on the other end says, hey, this is so-and-so from Rent-A-Center. And you were listed on an application uh, for some goods that this, this guy had um, rented from us. And we can't get a hold of him because he, he stole all our stuff. All of our furniture he stole um, that he had picked up. And Brent, just the sinking feeling, realizes that all day long he had been loading somebody else's furniture into this truck. And so Brent's on the phone, and he's like, I I'm sorry, you're breaking up. And he hung up. And no, I'm just I don't know what he did, but. <laughs> Bad reception, man. Got to go. He didn't, know, he didn't know where the family went. 
And, uh, and so <laughs> realizing that he was an accomplice now uh, to this crime, he was reflecting on it. And in his, his blog post today, he was, he was writing about this, how, how you know, it, it's, it's sometimes tempting to be afraid of acting like Jesus because we fear the outcomes will be negative ones. And if you accidentally commit enough crimes with people, you might start not wanting to actually interact, right? That's a natural thing. But here's, here's the deal, guys. We don't want to be unwise with our resources and our time. I'm not saying that at all, but we have to be like Jesus. And we don't see Jesus coming back to everyone he healed and everyone he forgave a year later and saying, now, how, what did you do with that forgiveness? What did you do with that healing? What did you do with God's mercy on your life? He just gave it. And I, I, I just feel like God is stirring us as a church just to be Jesus. And sometimes it's going to turn out really well and sometimes it, it, it's not going to be the best, but we have a job. And that's to follow after Jesus, to carry on the legacy of Christ on the earth today. And so I would ask us, could we, could we jump in on this? Sometimes it's going to be scary. Sometimes we're not going to know the outcomes. But his value system is still turning things on its head, and he wants to use us. He wants to use his church. Uh, we're the only plan. Do you know, did you know that? Like, we're it, you guys. There's no other disciples somewhere else that will do this for our city. It's us, it's other churches in our town, but together, we're it. And so we have this job to allow God to do a work in our lives so that those who have been overlooked and unnoticed for so long, who would look and say, God would never take notice of me, could stand and say, he's raised up the lowly. He's lifted up me. I don't have anything to offer. I don't, I don't have all the right stuff. I don't, I don't, I don't look the right way. I didn't, wasn't born into the right family. I don't have the right amount of, of money in my bank account. But God has noticed me. And so, Jesus, we would ask uh, just for your spirit to open up our eyes and our hearts to maybe receive something fresh and new from this gospel. For those maybe who have read this many, many times over, God, would you give a newness and a freshness and life to it like never before? That we would take notice of the lowly. And for those that, that feel and know that they're even on the bottom rung of society today, that you take notice of them. That you've seen them. That they're the heroes of this gospel. Lord, we receive your values. We receive your way today. May we grow in it. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you go, again, please stop by in the atrium. And if you want to join a group or just grab one of the, the printed guides and follow along with us as we go these 10 weeks. Also, our prayer teams are available. They have the blue lights. They would love uh, to pray with you. And other than that, enjoy the winter. We'll see you next week.